you know, hitchhike to school. And one day there was a knock on the door, and it was Coach Falconberry with a bag of groceries. And he brought him groceries to him, you know. That was the sort of acts, the little simple acts. He showed up at my apartment my last semester there, cooked for us. Uh, just did a lot of human things that made him more human than, than godlike. Jim, I appreciate you coming by and, uh, and sharing that. And, and as I said, Jim was the one who submitted the letter of nomination for Coach Falkenberry. Uh, obviously, this is personal for you and personal for all of his uh, players, former players that are here tonight. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Jim Doyle, everybody. We've heard a little bit about Coach Falkenberry, the coach. Now we're going to get a, a little taste of Coach Falkenberry, the man. Please welcome Coach's wife, Bonnie Falkenberry. I'm going to tell on myself here. You know, or originally, uh, Coach Russ's daughters were supposed to come in, but they live in Central Florida, and I don't know if you heard, but there was a little storm that came through there. So uh, they were unable to be here, and, and I knew that, uh, that Bonnie was going to be here, and, and today we had a little luncheon over at um, um, Bonton, Bonton Grill. And I got there uh, after Bonnie had already arrived, and we shook hands, and she said, it's good to see you again, but, th but the name never came up. And then I asked if she was one of Coach Falkenberry's daughters. Um, um, all right, you heard, you heard Jim talk uh, about, about Coach, but he was a husband and a father, and my guess is he didn't go, like, beat everybody up, all right? So uh, tell me a little bit about what he was like at home. Oh, he was, he was a strong disciplinarian. He was a, a big teddy bear most of the time. He was, he was very soft-hearted and always did a good job with the kids and his girls. He loved them most of all. He was a gourmet cook. Who was the better cook, him or you? He was, definitely. What, <laughs> Jim and Charlotte, they will know. <laughs> what, um, what were some of his specialties in the kitchen? Oh, um, Charlotte mentioned tonight his French onion soup. But what he did is he poured a can of, of French onion soup and they added onions to it and cheese and whatever, and, and Charlotte loved it. It was passion. We have now learned the definition of a gourmet. Uh, you know, after, but after his coaching career is over with, Coach probably made as big a contribution to society as maybe he did as a football coach, and a lot of people don't realize the people that he helped overcome alcohol and drug addiction. A lot of people don't even know that he did that. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, well, he was an administrator of a drug and alcohol hospitals, several different companies throughout the state, and he traveled and did a good job. I think he, he, made, a, he made a significant um, information you know, to the kids and to the people that needed him. Okay, I uh, want to give you a chance now to, to go ahead and, uh, and, and thank the folks that the, that the family wants to, uh, wants to thank, and uh, I'll give you the microphone to do that. Okay. Well, I want to thank Jim Doyle for his contribution, for his nomination. I want to, I want to thank the university and all of the staff for tonight and for all of the festivities. They've been awesome. I appreciate it, and Russ would, would love it, too. Thank you so much. Bonnie Falkenberry, everybody. Thank you, Bonnie. She was truly the first great women's basketball player at UL. 
and she came to us almost by accident. And more than 40 years after she first enrolled at USL, Lisa Merritt is still entrenched at the top of the record books. She is one of only two women's basketball players to have her jersey retired. Her 1,747 points scored in her career is the second highest total in school history. Her career scoring average of 16.8 is fifth highest. She also ranks third in career steals, 10th all-time in career assists. She's the only player in Cajun history to rank in the top 10 in scoring, rebounding, assists, and steals. She was a two-time All-Southland Conference selection in 1983 and 84 when her teams had a record of 40 and 16, the first two winning season in the school's Division I history. And after getting her degree in 1985, Lisa Merritt served our country for 20 years in the United States Navy. But how did a young woman from Florida wind up at USL, a school with very few resources? Former coach Mary Jo Castell went to a camp in Florida at the request of the administration. She was um, asked to go sign a player at a basketball camp there. Why? Because the men's basketball team was recruiting her boyfriend. Coach Walsh, uh, watched the recruit and wound up signing her, but it wasn't long before she was fixated on Lisa Merritt. She had the size, she had the grace, and most importantly, she worked hard. Coach Castell signed them both. The girlfriend lasted, I think, one season. Lisa Merritt became a legend. She was coached her senior season by Ross Cook, who said she had the Andrew Tony factor. She was intelligent, quick, and fast. She was a brilliant scorer who could create for herself and others at will and had an innate understanding of critical moments in the game. Her senior season, the Cajuns had a 22-6 and six record, and Coach Cook said the record might have been reversed if she had not had the strength and character that she had. In addition, Lisa was also very aware of social issues. She quietly led the discussions that had the team as a team to not stop the bus in certain states in the South. She stood against the injustices of the slowly changing South and personified grace, reason, strength, and perspective. Tonight, Lisa Merritt becomes only the fourth women's basketball player to be enshrined in this hallowed hall. It's ironic that a young woman who fought against injustice is the victim of injustice because this is long, long overdue. She is represented tonight by her daughter, Keisha. Please join me as we induct into the Raging Cajuns Hall of Fame from the sport of women's basketball, Lisa Merritt.
Lisa Merritt, everybody. <clears throat> Our next inductee was a big man. But his heart was bigger than his stature. Lynn Williams might be the most beloved employee in the history of this university. He spent 39 of his 56 years on earth as part of the Raging Cajun's equipment staff, serving as student manager, head equipment manager, and supervisor of equipment until his passing in March of 2019. In 2009, he was the recipient of the Glenn Sharp Award given to the National Equipment Manager of the Year. He was also named the Cajun's Athletic Department MVP Award winner for the 1991 athletic year. But Lynn Williams was much more than about awards or equipment. Lynn Williams was about relationships. Didn't matter what your name was, didn't matter what your position was, or even what sport you played. Lynn Williams cared about one thing, and that was making sure you as a student athlete were okay and that you had what you needed. He was meticulous in his work and impeccably organized. And he had a way of getting things done even with no budget, and you're about to find out how. <laughs> Hall of Famer Jake DeLone put it very simply, Lynn Williams made people happy. While Lynn was best known for taking care of the football team, the reality was he took care of everyone. He had a picture of himself stringing a catcher's mitt at the College World Series. And despite a skeleton staff, Lynn tried as best he could to make each coach feel like he was his number one priority. Lynn had a sense of humor, and he took per diem from more than one's unsuspecting sucker in a Blu-ray game. <laughs> he also cried pretty easily, but usually it was tears of pride or joy, especially when someone praised somebody on his staff. He is represented tonight by his brother Lyle, a big man, a big heart, and a big part of Cajun athletics history. Please welcome to the UL Hall of Fame, Lynn Williams. This is going to be fun. <laughs> and I think Lynn would not have it any other way. Um, for those folks that don't know, Lyle um, worked side by side uh, with Lynn for many, many years in the uh, equipment room at UL. But a lot of people didn't know this, and I didn't know this till I talked to you yesterday. When you were 12 years old, you actually moved in. You lived with him. Correct. Um, I'm the, the baby of, of uh, a litter, as we call it, but uh, <laughs> Lynn was 15 years older than me. So um, when I grew up, I was the last of all my siblings. He coached me in Little League, baseball, basketball, football. And so during summers, I would just stay with him throughout the whole summer. And eventually it became to him basically being, you know, my second dad. 
So uh, Lynn, was, Lynn was a father figure to me because my father was older and, and couldn't do the things that he did with my brothers when they were my age. So Lynn, Lynn filled in that gap and, and did that for me. And he fired you. <laughs> 39 years of Lynn being at UL, 34, 35 as a head equipment guy. He's only fired two people out of all the equipment managers that he's had. And he had an average between 25 and 40 equipment managers a year. And he's fired two. One was myself and one was my nephew. <laughs> um, you didn't stay fired long, though. No, I was, I was lucky enough uh, a week later, um, his assistant at the time, Chuck Borg, uh, told Lynn that was, that was crazy, that he needed to bring me back. You, uh, you wound up at Northwestern State. Um, and after you, um, after you graduated, Lynn couldn't hire you full time because of state nepotism laws. But as we found out with um, women's basketball and softball some years later, having co-department heads was okay. So you became the co-supervisor of equipment. But there's something about that that nobody knows, and I want you to share it with us. Yeah, so uh, um, when Mr. Sheck Snyder called me and, and invited me back, um, it was a dream of mine. I was in the equipment room since I was seven years old, traveling with the equipment staff, me and Brandon Stokely. And um, I always wanted to work alongside my brother. That was, that was really the only reason I went to college, to get a degree to work in athletics. Um, but I couldn't have that opportunity because of nepotism. So I, I left, worked with the New Orleans Saints, worked with Northwestern State, and I got a call to be co-head co -head equipment manager with my brother. So I immediately accepted it, not knowing salary, not knowing anything. I knew I was coming home. Um, after three years, I realized that my brother did me a huge favor. He didn't go to bat for me to bring me in, even though we knew we wanted to work together. But after three years of me working there, I found out he gave up half, um, a quarter of his salary to bring me in. So he took a huge pay cut when equipment was probably the lowest paid position in athletics. He took a bigger pay cut to bring me in and uh, to have me come there and work alongside of him. Yeah, it is. Now, those of you who have been here a while, you know, Dr. Maggard oversees a, a pretty decent-sized athletic budget. It's not as big as we want it to be, but, you know, let's go back to the 80s, if you would. When, um, when there was no budget, there really was no budget. And uh, let's go back to, uh, to times when, um, you know, baseball coaches work 90-hour weeks for $12,000 a year. Um, so if coaches didn't have budget, if teams didn't have budget, Equipment sure as hell didn't have any budget. And yet, I have never heard a coach or student athlete say that they wanted for anything. No, never. Lynn, uh, Lynn was a very big man, wasn't very mobile, as most people know. But he was able to accomplish more with a, a cell phone or, a, back then, a, a telephone than anybody else I've ever met in my life. Um, I've heard it several times that if uh, he was to ever run for mayor of Lafayette, he'd have won it and nobody would have known who he was because he just had connections through a, through a phone. He got more things done and more things donated to athletics than I think Dr. Sabwa has. He also, um, he also became quite beloved by other administrators. And, of course, the first year that administrators – were allowed to be named into the Hall of Fame. Three administrators were, and that was uh, Danny Cottenham, Sherry LeBas, and John Porsche, who was a trainer for many, many years. And, and you told me a line that Porsche had that you got to share before we get to the thank yous. So uh, Travis will know this one. I think he's still here. But uh, Mr. Porsche always had a line for Lynn that uh, Lynn could get more done with a hat and a T-shirt than anybody else. And he said if, if Lynn ever went before him and he showed up at the pearly gates and he was wearing a raging Cajun hat, he knew Lynn made it. Because <laughs> he could talk his way into that too. I don't think there's any question that he made it. I'm going to give you a chance now to give some thanks on behalf of the family. Yeah, our family is very honored. Um, UL has been our family. Um, Dr. Sabwa, for what you did for our family, a w a welcoming us all in, in there. Dr. Margaret as well. 
all the athletes, but most importantly, the student managers that, that worked with Lynn for 35 years. Those, those guys and girls put in so much hard work for each and every sport, and all of them did it because they loved UL. Lyle, I appreciate the time, and uh, congratulations to you and the entire family. Lyle Williams, everybody, on behalf of Lynn Williams. <laughs> There are coaches who will tell you, in order to achieve the highest of your goals with a team, you gotta have guys who hate losing more than they like winning. You're about to meet baseball's poster child. <laughs> he was the unquestioned leader of the best offensive baseball team in Cajuns history, and that one that many considered to be the best team that the Cajuns have ever had, even though they finished one game shy of the College World Series. The 2014 Raging Cajuns finished the season 58 and 10, the most wins and best winning percentage in school history, and that year the most wins in all of college baseball. The team never lost two consecutive games until being bested in the NCAA Super Regional by Ole Miss. It was a team that won the Sunbelt regular season championship, the Sunbelt tournament, and an NCAA regional. Jace Conrad, was the catalyst of that record-breaking team. He was named a consensus first-team All-American at second base by all five major All-American selections, something that no UL player has ever achieved. He was the player of the year as junior season in the Sun Belt and in the state of Louisiana, was a two-time honoree on the All-Sun Belt tournament team. In his junior season, he batted 381 with 96 hits, 20 doubles, and 65 runs batted in, and 22 stolen bases. His 68 games, 96 hits, 196 assists, and 19 times hit by pitch, all ranked third all-time on the single season list. His team won 101 games in his final two seasons, the best back-to-back -back seasons in school history. But he also excelled in the classroom. He was a three-time Sun Belt Academic Honor Roll selection in 2012, 13, and 14. He bypassed his senior season to turn pro after being drafted in the 13th round by Tampa Bay, but when his playing career was over with, he returned to school and got his degree in 2018. In my 31 years of broadcasting the Cajuns, he might be the most competitive SOB I've ever covered. <laughs> Please welcome to the Hall of Fame for the sport of baseball, Jace Conrad. Sit down, kid. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to say that Jason and I go back a ways, but many, many years ago, I, I umpired his dad's American Legion games when, when he was still a teenager. So the Conrad family, this, run, this runs a little, uh, a little deep. Um, but I think a lot of people got to know you and your brother, Bren, uh, because uh, you guys made a little trip to Williamsport, Pennsylvania when you were playing Little League. Yep. First off, that makes you old. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, yeah, but 2005, Little League World Series, me and Bryn <clears throat> were uh, obviously on that team. My dad was a coach, and uh, I think that's kind of where our baseball careers kicked off. You know, I remember, and I, and I told your dad about this later, that I was watching the first game in Williamsport, and um, – or maybe it was second. I, I don't remember. But I, but I know that a ball was hit, and the double play was started, and your younger brother on the, on the front end of the double play just caught the ball barehanded and threw, and I said, holy crap, we got something here. Um, it, was a, it, was, it, was a pleasure. Um, it was a pleasure then. But how did that prepare you for the rest of your career? Yeah, first off, he, he practiced that way too much in practice. My dad would get mad, but... It came came to play in the game, and that's why we do it. But, uh, no, it, it prepared me, I think, mostly just playing in front of people at such a young age. You know, it's not easy, right? You get, you know, the nerves kick in and whatnot. But um, that experience so early in our lives, I think, prepared us for this college level where you get thousands and thousands of people in the stands and, um, you know, it doesn't affect you at all. 
you know, we talked about Jace being competitor. Now, Jace not only hated the opposition, sometimes he hated his own teammates. <laughs> um, there, there's a story, okay? There's a story here. Now, it's normal when Coach Robichaud was with us that when he would go out to the mound, everybody in the infield would come in. But there was a time that you were not allowed to join the conversations at the pitcher's mound. Now, why was that? Yeah, that I'm not proud of that. But, um, <laughs> no, I can't remember who we were playing, but one of our pitchers was struggling at those strikes, and Coach Robe starts making his way out there. And uh, I got there about the same time he did, and I said, you have one job. And that's, <laughs> that's those strikes, give me the damn ball. <laughs> And from that point on, uh, Coach Robe would take his mound visits and just put his hand up, and <laughs> I'd stand out there by myself while everyone else met on the mound. So, is it, so I guess it's true that in all of the games that Coach Robe coached at UL that he was present for, you were the only one besides him to make a pitching change? <laughs> <laughs> you would twist that story, Jay. Um, also in 2014, you know, I think anybody who's followed Cajun baseball knows that Tony forever had a no facial hair rule. How were you the catalyst of changing Coach Robe's mind about facial hair? Um, that's a tough question. I, w we were playing at McNeese one when uh on during a midweek game and uh we're hitting bat in practice i'm waiting for my turn to hit and i'm just leaning up like i guess i was a coach sitting next to coach robe like hey that was a good swing right yeah and, and he goes yeah it was it's about time to shave and i was like shave i said coach you know we've been on a roll he said yeah but the, you know the rule i said look let's make a deal you know two games if we lose back-to-back -back games i will sh clean shave every day for the remainder of the season and he thought about it for a little bit, and he said, yep, you know, you're right. I don't want the reason for us losing to be because I made you shave. <laughs> and from that point on, we didn't lose back-to-back -back games, so the last two of the season. So, And so you looked an awful lot like Grizzly Adams out at second base by the end of the year, and, of course, your teammates all followed suit. You should have seen what was inside of it when I shaved it off, Jay. How long did, after the season was over with did it take you to shave that thing off? Uh, that night. Whenever we lost to Ole Miss, I shaved it that night. And uh, what's the longest your facial hair has been since? Not much longer than this. <laughs> you, um, you played on, the, on a Cajun team in, in 2012, which really was kind of the foundation for the 2014 team, because there were there were a lot of guys on that team that were just freshmen. You and I'm just going to do off, off the top of my head. I think you and Ryan Leonard's and uh, maybe Compton and Mike Strentz. Um, I know we're we're all very young then. And the following year, though, is when everything took off. And part of the reason that everything took off is you wound up with a hitting coach that had about the same attitude that you had uh, when it came to, to the. Um, to how do you how do you approach the game as a hitter? How much did that was Matt Degg's arrival? How much did that mean for you and for the rest of that team? It meant a lot. In fact, you know, I told him this morning, take baseball out of it. He changed my life in general. Just coming in, the mentality that he brings every single day is um, it's game changing. And 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 I think that was kind of you know he came in. We had a little bit different culture at the time. Um, he came in with high expectations. He set the bar high, and he lived up to everything that he said. And it was an extremely large part of how we were able to turn that uh, season around. He also, he also had a conversation with you personally. He did. He did. He, uh, he basically looked me in the eye and said, hey, you want to hit 250 for the rest of your career? And I said, no. And from that point on, you know, we had a little talk. I won't, you know, tell you exactly what was said. But um, I texted him last, that, I think that night, maybe the next day, and said, Coach, you know, I'm all in. So Now, you found out about being named to the Hall of Fame at the same time that you were addressing the team. Ken Myers came in and, um, and told you that uh, 
that you were going into the Hall of Fame. Now, that was much different than, than anybody else and uh, in, in how they were notified. What did that mean for you? It meant a lot. Um, I, I thought Coach Diggs might actually believe I was a good speaker, so he wanted to have me over <laughs> talking to the team, and I'm taking it all serious. You know, I'm locked in, and here comes Dr. Maggard and Ken Myers walking in. I'm like, do they care that much about what I have to say? <laughs> and sure enough, uh, that's what it was. So it means a lot. All right, let me give you a chance to thank some folks because uh, I know I know you got a list. Yeah, so I think first off, I want to thank my parents. Um, sacrifices you guys made over the years to allow me to play the game at such a high level um, that doesn't go unnoticed. You guys took the brunt of a lot of my career. Everyone else got to enjoy the good things, and you got the phone calls, and I was 0 for 30. So I love you guys, and I appreciate it. Um, to my brothers, my older brother couldn't be here. My little brother's here. Um, you know, my little brother in particular, playing with him for so many years, Bren, you were always pushing me from the bottom. And I wasn't letting you catch me. <laughs> and I thank you for that. You helped me reach that level of uh, success in my career. Um, my friends, obviously, half of these people didn't have name tags when they walked in. So the girl that was at the front, I apologize. <laughs> Thank you guys for all the support. And then, of course, my in-laws, in they weren't around at the time, but they've had to live those stories many, many times over the years. And they were there for me, you know, throughout pro ball. So I appreciate y'all and all the support. And then... My coaches, Coach Robe, changed my life, changed the way I went about my business every day. And um, I'm going to stop right there so I don't start crying, but I'd do anything to shake his hand again, give him a hug, and, and tell him thank you for everything that he's done for me. And then Coach Babb, Coach Deggs, the mentality that you guys taught me is something that I think about every single day of my life. And without you two, I wouldn't be the man that I am today. So. Thank you, guys. Chase Conrad, everybody. His nickname was Pee Wee, but there wasn't anything small about this guy. Ladarius Green became the most prolific tight end in Raging Cajuns history during a four-year career from 2008 to 2011 and a part of the team that rebounded from a 3-9 and nine record as a junior to 9-4 and four in a victory in the r &L Carriers New Orleans Bowl as a senior. He ranked sixth on UL's all-time receiving list with 149 receptions, fifth all-time in yards with 2,201, and only Brandon Stokely scored more receiving touchdowns in Raging Cajun history. Twice he was a top eight finalist for the John Mackey Award given to the nation's best tight end, two-time All-Sunbelt first team selection and twice named All-Louisiana. And he saved his best Cajun performance for his final game at Cajun Field when he caught 13 passes for 136 yards and a pair of touchdowns and recovered an onside kick late in the game as the Cajuns rallied from 11 points down in the final three minutes to beat ULM 36-35. He graduated from the university in three and a half years with a degree in finance. And then Ladarius Green was a fourth round draft pick by the San Diego Chargers. He played in 47 games for the Bolts with 26 starts, played six games with two starts for the Pittsburgh Steelers in 2016 before suffering a career ending injury. A tight end who is known as a difference maker in both the passing game and the running game, he's honored for those efforts tonight. Please welcome to the Hall of Fame from the sport of football, Ladarius Green.
I, I heard a I heard a story, and and I want to start with it. This guy comes. You know, Ricky Bussell was the head coach when um, when Ladarius was um, was recruited. Here's something you may not know. Ricky Bussell never saw this guy play football when he was in high school. He saw him play basketball and decided to offer him a football scholarship. Pee Wee, how'd that come about? I don't know how I feel about that because that's, that made me seem like my basketball career was real bad. <laughs> but uh, like you said, yeah, he never seen me play football and he offered me a scholarship and I really took it because I knew you all had a good business school and I was just thinking, you know, I didn't think I was too good at football. I'm gonna get a business scholarship. <laughs> so that's how it happened. And, and you, you, and as we said, you you, uh, you graduated with a degree in finance in, in three and a half years. Um, all right. So <laughs> when did we, we know when we figured out you were a good football player? When did you figure out you were a good football player? Um, I guess my senior year. I mean, my uh, <laughs> yeah, when my um brother was telling me that I was good, and my wife, my girlfriend at the time was something that I was a pretty good player, so I started believing him. A lot of people, myself included, um, think a lot about that last game at home against ULM when you had such a big game. And, you know, you, you caught a ton of passes, you scored a ton of touchdowns, but that onside kick might have been your biggest contribution maybe in your entire career because without that, the Cajuns don't win the game. And I don't know if they get a bowl invitation if you don't beat ULM that day. So your biggest play might have wound up being a reception that had nothing to do with the quarterback. And that's very true. And I think about that play all the time because you can't advance an onside kick, but I was trying my hardest to score a touchdown. <laughs> and it wasn't accounted, but in my head, it was just something I had to do. And look, I had forgotten you could not. And so he's to the 30. He's to the 20. And then, and then it came back. We had to do it again. Um, the team had never had a winning season until the final year. And Mark Huspeth was uh, the head football coach in his first season. HUD, hold the rope. How did his attitude toward the game affect you and that football team? Um, it helped a lot of our team buy in. Because, uh, like you said, he said, hold the rope. And he did a lot of things that we just didn't understand. But we all bought into it, um, like picking up grass off our field and taking it to the other team field and dropping on. It, it didn't make sense to us. <laughs> but everybody came on a one page like, it don't make sense to us either, but we're going to believe it. <laughs> like We're going to do it. And it just happened that um, we started to win. We started to believe in each other, and we started to win games. There was, not only was there hold the rope, there was also what's my name. Uh, and, and that was mostly a defensive thing. When they would make a big stop, they'd fall on me and they'd look at it and say, what's my name? Uh, because, of course, at the time, that fight to be recognized as Louisiana in, um, in athletics was raging, and, and Coach picked up on that too. Like I said, he did a lot of things when he came in <laughs> to make us buy in and tell us that, it wasn't about us, and he was going to make us focus all on one, and I respect him for that. And when I think about it, when I think back on it, because, you know, most coaches wouldn't just come in and start doing crazy things like that. <laughs> but he did it, and we can't complain about it at all. What it, what it, what's the commercial say? It's only crazy if it doesn't work, right? Okay, all right. All right, you go to the r &L Carriers New Orleans Bowl, and the other team scores a touchdown with about 30 seconds left. And uh, now you're behind in the game. What was the attitude on the sidelines? Um, that we were, it was our first time there. And we knew we were doing something that hadn't been done in a while. And we knew we had to pull it off, especially it was a home game for us because it's right down the street. And um, all our fans showed up. It, you know, words can't really explain the, what was going on in that moment. And when we pulled it off, I just I couldn't believe it mainly because it's a guy over there I talk about later when I thank him, but we all bought in and we all believed, so it, it was just something special. Well, well, you know, I know what my reaction was when, when the kick went through the uprights and I saw, you know, Coach Hutt on the sidelines. You personally, what was your reaction as well? 
I, it's a blur. But somebody told me, I said, where's my mom? <laughs> and I don't, I don't know how I felt about that, you know? But somebody said, that's the first thing I said. I was like, where my mom at? <laughs> and so I guess that was my first thought. You went to the National Football League and you played uh, alongside and, and, and well, behind at first and then ahead of a great NFL tight end in Antonio Gates. How did uh, your playing with him, your relationship with them, how'd that make you a better football player? He humbled me because coming up through um, college, when people started telling me I was good, he reminded me like, you're not better than me. <laughs> so it was very humbling. Um, he taught me a lot. He was like a big brother to me on the field. And like you said, he's a great player, Hall of Fame player. And um, he took me in like a little brother and taught me all the ropes. Okay, you said uh, something about you wanted to talk a little bit about a daycare center, and I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Uh, yeah, I work at my mom's daycare. I'm the uh, designated bus driver most days. <laughs> and um, people uh, ask me why I do it, but when you, Take your time, we got you. Hey, Karai. <laughs> when your parents sacrifice so much for you, I'm sorry, y'all. Oh. But um, when they sacrifice you, that's something you'll go do, you know. No matter how goofy you look, uh, six foot six, I get in the van to drive around elementary kids. You know, that's something you do for people that you know went out, went out that way for you. It's called giving back. And, 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 and giving back is a good thing. Okay, now that you've started crying, uh, we're gonna, we'll, g we'll give you an opportunity to go ahead and thank the folks you want to thank, and, and if you cry some more, that, that's totally okay. I'm gonna try my best not to. Um, I already thank my parents, you know, because they did so much, but when I got here, it was about three guys, and one of them, I'm getting old. <laughs> you know, this like, this age you start crying a lot when you get older. And I'm starting to see that. But uh, Coach Wingerter, he took me in like a son. You know, I still remember the first thing he said to me when I got here. You're not going to play <laughs> unless you block. And I thought he was crazy. I was like 200 pounds. But he told me, um, you're not going to play unless you block. And he believed in me when I didn't believe in myself, even when he didn't coach me anymore. Um, I had a different coach for like three years, but he was still right there. The crazy man on the sideline. <laughs> you see somebody headbutting people, bleeding? That was Coach Wingarder. You know, um, and I can't thank him enough. And Coach Dez, <clears throat> my quarterback coach when I first got here, um, him and Matt. They took me in like I was a little brother. They fed me Thanksgiving. You know, a boy from Florida, we, we ain't going back home. <laughs> they took me to their house, fed me, treated me like I was family. And um, I just had to thank those guys. And, of course, can't forget my brothers. They believed in me. My little brother right there, the big one, <laughs> he pushed me, called me sorry. So that made me a little bit better. And of course, my wife, um, she was my girlfriend then. And it takes a special woman to love a football player because we bang our heads all the time. We, we can't think clearly, but um, <laughs> you know, she was there. She believed him. She pushed me all the time. She told me I was good. Bad days, she told me I was going to be better. And I can't thank her enough. And we can't thank you enough. Ladarius well, Green, everybody. All these damn people crying and blaming me for it. <laughs> All 
Our next inductee was a four-year letterman who led the Cajuns to their first ever NCAA Division I golf championships where they finished 15th. He finished 12th personally in the NCAA National Championships as an individual, the second highest ever by a, U a Cajuns golfer in Division I. That same season, the Cajuns won the first of three straight American South team championships. And in his final two years, Mike Heinen was a first team all-conference selection, earned medalist honors as the top individual as a senior in 1989. He was named Honorable Mention All-American in 1988 and third team in 1989. He also earned all Louisiana honors in his final two seasons. As a professional, he is one of only two Cajuns ever to win a PGA Tour event, the Shell Houston Open in 1994, in only his 10th ever start on the big tour. He shot 16 under par to win by three strokes over, get this, Tom Kite, Hal Sutton, and Jeff Maggard. He had three top 10 finishes in his rookie season, followed that with three top 10, six 20, top 25, and two runner-up finishes the following year. His professional career spanned 17 years. He made 90 cuts on the PGA Tour, 90 cuts on the nationwide circuit. His career earnings totaled yeah, quite a bit of money. Please welcome to the Hall of Fame from the sport of golf, Mike Heinen. Look, as long as you don't cry, you're going to be okay. They still have beer. <laughs> All right. This is the, the thing about, about Mike that, that boggles my mind. Okay. Mike was born in rain, but he actually. In the rain. No, not in the rain, in the, in the town of rain, but actually grew up in what can only be called a suburb of Welsh. Now, I want to know, how in the world does a guy who lives 35 miles from the closest golf course learn how to be one of the greatest golfers in the school's history? He hit a lot of golf balls against the Bourne. <laughs> uh, uh, my dad talked to me a few times, and wanted, I wanted to go play in you know, rounds of golf, and dad would always say, you know, look, you got to get better. And I'm like, how am I going to get better on where I don't have a place to hit. So finally, I started hitting golf balls against the Bourne. Uh, I didn't have to chase them down as much. I wouldn't lose as many because I didn't have a lot of golf balls back then. And uh, I would hit the golf balls against the Bourne. And most people don't know this, but when you hit one of the studs in the Bourne, the ball comes back at you. So I got pretty quick at that, too. But um, it was uh, hitting golf balls against the Bourne and uh, eventually got to where Dad started bringing me over to the golf course for and started uh, getting a little better at it. What made you want to want to want it to be golf to begin with? My my grandfather played and my dad played and uh, we go on a big family trip and that's why I started practicing. I wanted to play on when we went on the family trip. Uh, they would play. We'd go to different places and we'd play golf. And my dad said I couldn't play with my uncles and my grandfather until I got better. But none of them could break a hundred, so it wasn't too long before I was playing. <laughs> Didn't take long to beat the guy uh, in the family. All right, first couple of years, um, you didn't have a conference to play in. You, you guys played as an independent. How much did the formation of the American South Conference and the opportunity to play in a conference and compete, how much did that help you down the road? It was good. I didn't really know much about it. Golf is, you know, I've always been an individual sport, and it's so neat in college because you have teammates. And, you know, we're all playing. We're playing as individuals, but we're also playing as a team. Uh, so to play in conference tournaments where you're playing against, you know, other schools and, and you, you know, really get to kind of compare yourself, it, it, it made it fun. It, you know, we really felt like we could compete uh, every time. And uh, that, as we got pushed and started playing better in conference tournaments, it started. we started playing better on the bigger stages and NCAAs. And quali back then they had regionals qualifying for NCAAs, and that was very tough to, to get in the field, and we were able to do that. How, 
you had some teammates who obviously could hit a golf ball pretty well uh, as well. But to be able to accomplish that, and once again, you know, you don't have the resources that a, a lot of these other these other schools had. What was it about those particular teams, and and of course, you know, you as an individual, that enabled you to qualify for regionals, finish in the top 15, and for you individually to finish in the top 12? It's, you know, golf, it's, a, you know, you play on the different golf courses, so we were welcomed at Oakbourne, La Triomphe, Cadian Hills, all the golf courses around. They let us hit balls on the ranges. We had a lot of players, a lot of ex-players. Uh, uh, everybody loves golf. We had a golf tournament today. Everybody loves golf. It's uh, So they, they – Kind of took in the team and, uh, and and welcomed us into their country clubs and and we were able to play and uh, it, it it really made it fun and and I go to see the facility today and Ladarius was talking about the lock we were looking at the locker room and I know he didn't have much of a locker room when he was here and at Oakbourne Country Club there's a beautiful clubhouse with a for the players a locker room and a hitting area we didn't have that either so it was uh, but it, it was neat to be kind of part of that to grow it up. All the athletes before me got me to, you know, our area, and then, you know, hopefully we built it from there and, and, and got more, you know, more golfers involved and, and, uh, and improved from there. All right, so you go on the PGA Tour, and it did not take long before you were a champion on the professional tour. Did you ever say, shoot, this is going to be easy? <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of a thing where you know, everybody said, well, how did you do it? How did you do it? And, you know, I, I remember having Steve Stricker. I was sitting down with him in Atlanta the week after I won, and we were good friends, played the Canadian tour and the, and the smaller tours together, and we were both on the PGA Tour. And, and he just goes, he goes, I can't believe you did it. And I'm like, gee, thanks. And he goes, well, I didn't mean it that way. He's such a nice guy. But, he, you know, uh, he, 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 uh, but, you know it, it was kind of – I said, look, I said, it's – you know, it, you kind of – he said, how did you get to that point? And I said, well, I was right around the lead after the first round, and I was right around the lead after the second round, and then I was leading going to the third round. Hey, I might as well finish this thing off. And, uh, you know, just didn't know didn't know much, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't know it wasn't possible. And uh, so to go and pull it off made it, uh, made it pretty special. Uh, but it, it does get harder. It becomes a job. It becomes work, and other things start – you know, coming in and, and uh, you know, there's a, always a new crop coming up trying to knock you off the top. You played on the Nationwide Tour as well, and, of course, a Nationwide stop is right here uh, with the Louisiana Open uh, out at La Triumph. And I heard this, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. You had a round there on the Nationwide Tour where you shot a 61, and that was like your lowest score as a professional. Is that right? Yes, that was my, uh, I think it's my lowest score ever uh, in, in, a, in a tournament. Uh, and it was a 61 at La Triomphe, the third round, I think it was. And uh, it was pretty neat. A uh, guy had shot 62 the day before, and so I broke his record the next day. So he only had it for about a half a day. He did it in the afternoon, <laughs> I did it in the morning. He's been cussing you ever since. Um, I, I got to ask you, you know, you said you played in the, in the golf tournament today. How'd you hit him? Uh, a lot. Uh, I, I don't play much anymore. But uh, we had a good time. I had my ex-teammates with us, and uh, we rode around the cart and made some made some birdies and a couple eagles, and we had a good time. Did you have a beer? A uh, one. Okay. All right. Good. All right. I'm going to give you an opportunity to thank some folks. The floor is yours. Uh, first off, I want to thank my mom and dad who are here. Uh, like everyone says, any anybody. I don't care if you're a student athlete or just going to college. I mean, mom and dad are the ones that that you know get you there and uh and, and make sure you stay on the right path they taught me right and taught me to stay on the right path and i want to thank them for that and uh, i got my wife who was my girlfriend in high school and went through college and got married and she traveled with me played on the canadian tour nationwide tour tc jordan tour every tour there is before we got on the pga tour and she caddied for me and uh, drove the van and got me from tournament to tournament. And uh, so it, it was, uh, she sacrificed a lot to do that. And uh, I, I, I thank her because, you know, she's done so much for me. I have my son, William, here, who uh, my, my daughter and my youngest son uh, are at home. But uh, William's here. And I always tease William because he was a swimmer. And I'd have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and bring him to the pool. And I said, why don't you just play golf? We'll go play nine holes, eat a cheeseburger, and go play the back nine. But 
he wants to go swim seven miles every morning. So, but uh, so it was great. Got a good friend of mine from uh, from Welsh, uh, Lori Ordway, who's a friend of mine. He's been a coach in the area here for a long time, and uh, he he was probably one of my biggest fans. He would come caddy for me at tournaments, and I've got Jeff Calloway, David Church, and Mike Genovese, who are teammates of mine. I have them here tonight, and all my other teammates, my coaches. Uh, it, it's just it's just a, you know it was a pleasure playing here. Such an honor to be um, you know. In the Hall of Fame, uh, I can't believe I'm saying I'm in the Hall of Fame, but I'm in the, in the Hall of Fame, I guess now. Is it official now? So, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it, and uh, I just had a great day today. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Bye, Kyan and everybody. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you, man. I, I got to tell you, and, and, and I, you know, this last one's kind of personal. Um, I've watched Raging Cajun softball for a long time. And there have been a, a, a few student athletes that I've really, really admired. And in softball, it's Allison Habits, Ashley Brignac, and our next honoree. And tonight, all three of them will be in our Hall of Fame. There have been a number of outstanding hitters in softball history, but you would be hard pressed to find one better than our next honoree. Despite being lightly recruited out of high school, and you're gonna find out more about this in a minute, at Mount Carmel in New Orleans, her numbers make her one of the most decorated softball players in school history, and for that sport, at this school, that is one hell of an accomplishment. In her season, senior season, Christy Orgeron was named a first team All-American after being named second team a year prior. She was a three-time All-South Region selection, a four-time All-Sunbelt selection, and the Sunbelt Conference Player of the Year in 2011 and 2012 after being named Freshman of the Year in 2009. She was chosen the Louisiana Hitter of the Year in 2011 and 2012 and was an All-Louisiana selection four times. She was also named the 2011-2012 recipient of the Corbett Award as the State of Louisiana's top female athlete. She was a two-time most valuable player in the Sunbelt Conference Tournament. She excelled in the classroom. She was twice named to the Sunbelt Conference honor roll and twice to the commissioner's list. During her career, the Cajuns compiled a record of 194 and 48, including 77 and 18 in the Sunbelt Conference and a 10 and 4 record in NCAA regional play with two regional championships. She set an NCAA record with six Grand Slam home runs in one season and set school records for runs batted in in a season with 101. She also holds UL records for extra base hits in a season with 48, in a career with 141, doubles in a game with three in South Alabama, Grand Slams in a season with six, as I mentioned, and in a career with nine. She is second in career total bases, fourth in home runs, and are you ready for this? Her 288 runs batted in is the eighth best in the history of NCAA college softball. <laughs> the school and this state has produced many All-American level collegiate hitters, but she ranks up there with the very best. Please welcome to the Hall of Fame from softball, Christy Ogeron. girl. All right, first congratulations, and, and it's just a joy to have you sitting up here with me tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so fired up after this hearing everyone talk. I'm like, Jerry, can you get me a COVID year to come play another, play another round? You know, a lot, of, a lot of people don't know this, but when Christy was in high school, she played, for a, she played on a state championship team in soccer. You were also a swimmer. Yes, um, I, uh, I never actually swam until high school and I didn't have anything to do until soccer season started. So uh, five foot eight freshman apparently was welcome on the swim team. 
Okay, so where, where did this softball thing come in? Um, growing up, my brother and I were super competitive. We were 18 months apart, and um, you couldn't tell me that boys were better than girls, and so we competed at everything, and we were a baseball, soccer family, and um, uh, they wouldn't let me play with boys, so I ended up playing softball and kind of ended up, uh, ironically, getting recruited unintentionally. <laughs> um, I thought I was going to go play college soccer, and um, nobody really recruited me for anything. So when Coach, uh, it's actually Lacey Prejean that showed up at a game uh, in Indiana, out of all places, and uh, Coach Mike kind of started following me and uh, found something that he liked and took a chance on a kid that didn't play travel ball until she was 17. As a matter of fact, the, the day that you told me, the day that he showed up, he went and, uh, and your coach said, well, she's not playing today. <laughs> yeah, he, he tells people all the time that he has to stop drinking when he's recruiting. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, ch he showed up to a game in Colorado, and, and there's this one stadium, in Hall of Fame Stadium, where there's this 50-foot wall, and he had gone to the coach and said, hey, I'm, I'm here to see this kid. And the coach said, hey, she's not playing this game. He said, well, I'd like to see her. He said, sorry, got to come back later. Uh, so he watched me warm up one of our pitchers before a game and, and saw my framing, and then he watched me take that in practice before the game, and he tells me now that that's the, the moment he decided that he, he wanted to have me, that thought I was a good enough athlete. But still, <laughs> you, you, you weren't heavily recruited. As you mentioned, you didn't play travel ball until you were 17. You didn't always start, and yet, I, I, I just read all of this stuff, okay? And, and, and you even redshirted your freshman year because they didn't think you were ready. Yeah, I, I you know, coming in uh, was obviously very competitive, wanted to play. Um, and I don't know, I'm sure everyone in here knows that we have some pretty talented softball players that come through this program. And, and so I, I quickly realized coming to the game at 17 that it was probably going to be the best for me to, to get a year of developing. And I really trusted Coach Mike and the program that he put together. It's, it's not hard to bind into a program that produces all Americans pretty much every single year. So... Uh, I sat out that first year and turned out to be one of the best development years that I, I could have had. I, um, I didn't get to see softball play all the time because of my, my commitment to, uh, to baseball and, and, my, and my duties there. But one thing that I, I noted, you know, you've smiled a lot tonight, but I got to tell you, in the, in the times that I saw you, I don't remember you smiling very often. You were a pretty intense person. Yeah, I mean, it's great to, to kind of see, like, Jason, Ladarius, and all. We, we were, I saw Austin. I saw, you know, Justin was here as well. We were all here around the same time, and, and it was right when, when Dr. Savoy came in, and, you know, really softball and baseball kind of had really good reputations that we, we put out pretty good teams, but he came in and he really invested heavily into the, the athletic programs, and, and that was the turning point here, and it really just became fun to be a student athlete. You really got to rally behind everyone else and it was really easy to kind of be great because you were always pressing the other teams trying to be better than them and trying to get the attention and um and so we really pulled greatness out of each other which was really fun talk to me a little bit I, you know you had the competition and, and you know you of course dominated the sunbelt conference but you played tough schedules you were in regionals every year you won regional championships you complete competed in super regionals so you had the competitive spirit against other but what about within the team itself? Yeah, every day is a battle. I mean, you're talking about a team where at any point anyone could probably be a starter on almost any other team in this country. And um, it's funny, you know, like Ladarius was talking about when HUD came in and, and doing all these crazy things. Like, you want to talk about crazy things. You talk about Coach Mike with his split grip. And you got people on national television being like, well, I don't understand how this works. And then it's like, well, there goes my home run. You can go get it and let me know how that worked out. <laughs> when... <laughs> All right, when you <laughs> when you were um, okay, you're in, in, in you know, okay. We're going to get to this goofy split grip thing. How did you buy into it? Um, yeah, again, like uh, everyone's kind of you know, Mike Mike said it really well um, about golf and how what what he did. He hoped it, it built another you know foundation for the next group of people that came in. And and I was lucky. I I wasn't the first person he came to. I was like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. Let's just see how this goes. You know, there was. A legacy of athletes and student athletes and women that came before me that originally bought into it and they built the program and the success was already there so you'd be crazy kind of not to and you know going all the way back to even like Yvette Gerard who started this team in a cow pasture um, I mean like can you imagine being on that team and it's like we're gonna go to the World Series and you're like okay <laughs> yeah they started they started with uniforms that Mama Rosemary made by yeah. by hand yeah 
and it, it started like that, and it's uh, and it's kept going strong and strong and strong, and it's strong again. And uh, for those of you that follow softball, Jerry hasn't released the schedule yet, but wait until you see it. <laughs> Woo! Jerry, Jerry told me they got uh, Jerry told me they just got AC and the indoor hitting facility. I said, wow, it must be nice to have an indoor for hitting facility. <laughs> All right, so you got Pee Wee with the Student Athlete Performance Center, and Heinen over with his clubhouse, and and now you with the with the indoor hitting facility. Yeah, yeah. We built that, Jerry. <laughs> you know, look, I obviously, Coach saw something in you, and um, you were able to make the most of it. But I read off all of that stuff. Okay, you know, you were, you were another UL player when you came in, and you're leaving as one of the greatest ever. At 17, you couldn't have begun to think that was going to happen. Uh, no, I mean, this is far I, – I don't want to say it far because I feel like everyone goes, like, I'm so humbled, and I, I truly am. Like, anyone who knows me, like, I really rarely ever talk about my softball career, and it's not because it's not something I'm super proud of. I just try, you know, to, to really just remain humble because what you don't know is, like, yeah, I hit six grand slams, but you don't hit grand slams with the bases empty. Um, what people don't know is I had three hitters batting over 400 in front of me. Uh, so it's really easy to hit 101 RBIs when somebody's on the base every single time you get up to bat. Yeah, and at the same time, somebody's got, got to knock them in, kid. I'm just saying. Um, I, I, I know that there's some folks you want to thank. I'll give you an opportunity to do that now. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, you know, it's funny. I've, I've won a, a lot of awards, fortunately. I, I put on a lot of hard work. I'm super proud of that. And, and I always said that if I ever got to speak, the first person I would ever thank would be God. And, and what's funny, this is the first time I've ever actually, like, spoken at an awards thing. So um, this is a full circle moment for me. Like, I really came to my faith at this school, and so this place is so important to me. And, and I've got some people that kind of helped walk me along that journey. And everyone's thanked their parents so far. And, um, you know, my mom didn't miss a single game my senior year. Um, she would drive up here, drive two hours back the same night. Uh, my dad used to hang out in the camp. He was the proud sponsor of the camp out in the outfield. Um, and what most people know is my parents were actually my harshest critics. Um, you know, my dad would sit there and be like, why'd you strike out? Right behind me in right field, by the way. And then I'd finish the game. My mom would be in the car and be like, you went 0 for 2. I'm like, thanks, Mom. Appreciate that. Um, but, I, you know, they, they modeled excellence for me. They, they chased excellence in everything that they do. And it's really laid a foundation for for my brother and I to, to really build successful careers. So, you know, so, so thankful for that. Um, I've got some other family members, uh, you know, my stepdad, my stepmom got toted around to so many different games and so just appreciative of their support. Uh, my aunt I was fortunate enough to be here. I had so many family members. So um, I'm going to try to like not roll this on because I feel like you could thank people for forever. Um, I'm so thankful to, to coach Mike and stuff for, for taking a chance on a no name kid and developing me and pouring into me and allowing me to, to be my best self, uh, to all the administrators here who invest in our program, um, and, and most importantly, to, to my teammates. Um, like I said, softball is a team sport, and I can name off like this 10 other girls that I played with who could easily be in this seat tonight. Um, and so just, you know, I, I'm, again, my, my college roommate's here. She was uh, an athlete as well. Um, I'm fortunate enough my, my girlfriend was able to make it in for this. And so the, the amount of support you get in this community as a, raging Cajun, as a member of the Raging Cajun family is unreal. Um, this has been such a surreal night for me, getting to, to meet up with some of my, my fellow athletes and, and be a part of this together. It feels like all that blood, sweat, and tears that you guys were talking about really came kind of to fruition. And, and so this, is, this has been an absolute magical night. So thank you so much. Christy Ogeron, everybody. Try not to fall down. Yeah. Um, but Keisha, come on up here. And look, we're not going to sit down. We're just going to stand up, you and me. Come over here. <laughs> Keisha Merritt, everybody. Um, <laughs> you know... Your mom's a, a very interesting story because not only did um, she have a wonderful career here, but then after she served this university, she served the United States of America for 20 oh. years uh, as a part of the U.S. Navy. <laughs> so, so you grew up as the daughter of a military mom. What was that like? 
First of all, I grew up with the daughter of Lisa Merritt, <laughs> and if you know, you know. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, basketball was just the foundation, the fundamentals of who Lisa Merritt was. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying not to do it, y'all. I promise you I'm not. Um, she was just an excellent person, and I just could not leave her tonight and not speak on my mom's behalf. I couldn't do it. Um, I traveled 10 hours to be here in the middle of Ian. So I wasn't going to not just say, my mom was great, and it goes beyond basketball. She was a great mom. She lost her battle to breast cancer, and even then she fought to the end, you know? So I'm only emotional because she was supposed to be here to see this. They retired her jersey years ago, and we were supposed to, Ben came and made that trip here. But unfortunately, she fell ill, you know? So I'm just thankful that people out there still think about my mom. Because I think about her every day. And I just want to thank everybody for being here and honoring her. Because she was truly a, a wonderful woman. And that's all I wanted to say, y'all. Thank you, Keisha. Couple, a couple more things before we wrap this up tonight. Uh, first of all, I see my good friend Gerald A. Barrett standing over here. Uh, he is one, and if anybody else is standing up, uh, please continue to do so. But, you know, we've inducted seven new people into the Hall of Fame tonight. But I want to recognize those that are already a member of the UL Hall of Fame. Gerald A. Barrett is one. The rest of you, if you're a member of the Hall of Fame, please stand so we can recognize you as well. Thanks so very much. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, sometimes irony is what irony is um, because I had planned to close by saying something and then, you know, Keisha was supposed to be the second person that we talked to and as it turned out, she becomes the last one and what I was going to say was tomorrow's October 1st and that's Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I hope that uh, all of you will think about that during the month of October and donate to the charity of your choice. Um, breast cancer took her mom. Breast cancer took my mom uh, when she was only 52. But, there, but breast cancer now uh, can be cured. There's a lady right here that's a walking example of that. And uh, so I, I just want to take a moment just to remind all of you of that. Uh, that wraps things up tonight. I got nothing cute to say. Want to say thanks to Aaron Robichaux one more time. Oh, Ken's got his hand up. So Aaron's going to close so that I'll get seven phone calls tomorrow morning to give these guys their credit. Okay. Aaron is going to come up and give uh, the, the, the seven folks the, the schedule for tomorrow, which is a good thing because I don't know what, what it is. I do know I got to be in the broadcast booth and kick us off, kick off is at 4 o'clock. That's about all I know. All right, my dear. Thank you all for coming. This was a great night. I thank all my help, RCA st RCAF staff, Sodexo, our home, uh, Hancock Whitney is our dinner sponsor. Thank them for everything that they've done. So tomorrow, everybody should have gotten a packet, all of the inductees. At 1230, you will meet at the Blackham Coliseum to line up for the parade. The parade begins at 1.30 and it'll end at the alumni tent where we'll all get off. At 3 o'clock, Dr. Maggard's suite will open. We can go up there. We'll have fresh drinks and food for everybody. Kickoff is at 4 o'clock. You get um, recognized on the field first quarter, third time out. So I'll be up there. I'll move everybody down. All family is invited on the field. So tomorrow's a big day. We're really, really excited. I'll see you all at 12.30. Thank you. Look, I got nothing else. Thanks to all of the inductees this evening. Thanks to all of you for getting here. And I, the only th other thing I got to say is, go Cajuns. We'll see you tomorrow.